I want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, exciting night where we're going to have the California State Board of Accounts come and talk to us about the uh, requirements for licensure in the state of California, CPA licensure. So with no further ado, uh, my name is John Lord. I'm the director of the uh, CPA Applied Program here at Golden Gate, so welcome. And I'm with no further ado, gonna turn it over to Amy McClellan and I'll let her introduce herself. Oh, great. So welcome. I already kind of introduced myself, but I'm the Dean of the Business School at Golden Gate University. I'm a lawyer and I also have a background in tax. I have a master's degree in tax and um, my very first job was in accounting. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I really love this field. I think that it's a great job to have and a great skill set to have as well. It can be a applied across a lot of different disciplines. So welcome. The name of the program tonight is CPA, the Game Changer. And I do have to say that, you know, I was thinking about it. I, I have a lot of friends who early in their careers didn't really know what they want to do, you know, kind of travel from job to job, weren't terribly happy. And a lot of them ended up becoming a CPA and um, really, really liking their jobs and going in all different directions, including my baby brother who um, is a, a VP, um, but he start in, in a very, very large hundreds of billion dollar company, but he started out as a CPA. So um, I, I've seen where the designation can get you and it's pretty impressive and uh, I, th I think it's good work so you guys are all in the right place and you're going to hear from the people that know even more than I do about it. <laughs> so um, you know uh, the other thing that's important to understand is what it what is involved in becoming a CPA and um, so tonight you're going to learn all about the California Board of Accountancy and all the rewards of becoming a licensed CPA. Um, I think that having the designation CPA demonstrates a level prof of proficiency that sets you apart from other people that have accounting degrees. Um, and there's a really great lineup of speakers tonight that are going to talk to you about that, um, including two of the staff members from California Board of Accountancy. One is an expert in exam questions. So if you have any burning questions about the exam questions, and one is about licensing questions. Um, and uh, we also have John Lord, our faculty member, and um, some alumni here today. So welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm... So I'm delighted to have uh, Nancy Kerrigan Corrigan here. <laughs> so Nancy is the president of the California Board of Accountancy. Welcome, Nancy. And she's our first speaker. And I really have to just say thank you for taking the, the time out of your day or your evening to come and talk to all of our students at Golden Gate University. I, I think it's really wonderful that you are um, here with us today. So Nancy has had a really fantastic um, career. She's a CPA. She joined the Board of Accountancy in 2018 and is now the president. Prior to serving on the board, she was a partner in several accounting firms, including Jeffrey Corrigan and Shaw for 30 years. And the next one, the most recent one, Singer Lewak, I, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, interesting name. So and, and, and so she was a partner and an owner. Um, and, and I think that's a really great place to be in terms of being able to somewhat work for yourself. Um, so so uh, I don't know, I can't say more about that. <laughs> She's a, a member of the California Society of CPAs, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and she previously served on the Board of Accountancy's Enforcement Advisory Committee, the Peer Review Oversight Committee, and the Qualifications Committee. Being a CPA, there's a lot of ways that you can be involved in your community, the community of CPAs. And also I noticed that she worked with Team Challenge of Southern California on their audit committee. So there's all sorts of places where you can be helpful in businesses and nonprofits, um, pretty much anywhere that there's always this skill set needed. Um, she is also a member of the California State Polytechnic Institute's Accounting Department Advisory Council, and that's her alma mater. I don't know if you're still doing that, but you were. <laughs> and um, she 
uh, as I said, she's worked with the nonprofit as well. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about the benefits of becoming a CPA and probably a little bit about the California Board of Accountancy. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much. And yes, I am still on Cal Poly's advisory council. I've been many, many years. And I have to underscore really everything you have said because my career has just been a wealth of opportunity as I will get into a little bit later in the presentation. So, so many avenues, so many options, so many opportunities. It's just, it's amazing. So you've, you've really kind of hit the nail on the head. So my name is Nancy Corrigan and I am a certified public accountant or we are known as CPAs. And I currently serve as the president of the board of California Board of Accountancy. I was governor appointed in um, 2018. Uh, and we refer to the California Board of Accountancy as, as the CBA. So we have CPAs and we have CBAs, uh, not to confuse, confuse anybody. Now this evening, we are fortunate to have a fellow CBA member on the agenda who will be speaking a little bit later. She's an alumna of your university. So Ms. Jong will be sharing um, about her success upon graduating from Golden Gate University and becoming a certified public accountant and even serving on the CBA, which is quite an honor. So we will be hearing from her. We also have two of our staff, as you've mentioned, Suzanne Gracia, examination unit manager, and uh, Ramona Bermuda's initial license unit manager. So they have a lot of valuable information regarding the examination process and the licensing process. Uh, in their presentation. So on behalf of all of my fellow board members and all of our some 100 staff to regulate this gigantic state of California and it's some 108,000 licensees, thank you so much for having us here tonight. The opportunity to speak directly to the students about the benefits of becoming a CB and the process of doing so is just really welcomed uh, by us because we're here to help students figure out how to get there and beyond. And so that's what we're here to do. So the um, California Board of Accountancy is a state agency and it regulates the practice of public accounting in California and issues CPA licenses to those who are, have met the requirements under the law. And our mission is protection of consumers, those relying on the services provided by CPAs in California. And that may be directly impacting them or indirectly impacting them. And those are individuals and business organizations, all organizations that re may rely on those services. So very, very important mission that underscores everything that we do. So our responsibility is to evaluate candidates such as those students that are gonna go along decide to take the exam, but to um, evaluate them, determine, determine whether they meet the requirements to become licensed. We then issue licenses to those who meet those requirements. Once they are licensed, we must ensure that all CPAs in California follow uh, the professional standards that we kind of sign up. When we play, decide to play this game, we sign up and agree to follow those standards. And so this board ensures that that is what happens. And it really keeps the level of quality, you know, that bar that we all strive to reach at a really high level, which is what all of us CPAs should want from our competition within the state and without the state. Um, once you become licensed, there are also continuing education requirements that must be met every two years. That's to keep only qualified CPAs practicing and to keep that level, that bar that I referred to really high uh, so that we're doing everything in accordance with professional standards. So I encourage you students to pursue your CPA license as I did. You actually will be entering the profession in an even more interesting time than I did so many years ago. Um, and that's because there are so many technological advancements in the world today. Um, it's ever evolving, just things that didn't even exist when I became licensed. So there's so many new and exciting things that will be happening and new tools and ways to approach client service engagements. Um, and the uniform CPA exam will be updated in 2024 to reflect all of this and to test you on those things. So um, 
your professors will be working on updating and upgrading and preparing students for the exam and for that nature of questioning that will occur in, in 2024. So future CPAs will be better equipped to handle clients and companies' needs than ever before. So I just encourage you to strongly consider this. So being a CPA has been very, very rewarding for me um, as the public accounting profession has a long and very important history. The need for our services are even greater than they've ever been before. And I've, and I've alluded to this already in what I'm saying, but let's think about the changing business environment. We're no longer just domestic. We're no longer just in the United States. We are global, we're international. Technology is creating opportunities for accountants. We've all heard about data analytics, artificial intelligence, just to mention a few of the words that are being, terms that are being batted around and they're trying to be adapted into the process of accounting and auditing and taxation. So um, there is ever professional changing auditing and accounting standards and tax laws and regulations. These have to change and evolve to keep pace with the ever changing business environment. So it's, it's just a, a constant uh, evolution that's going on. We have continuing reliance on our services by third parties, the bankers, bonding companies, government you know, funding agencies, other organizations that fund, that rely on financial statements and other services so that they can comfortably uh, fund and do that sort of thing. So that's just to mention a few. And some of the negativity from before, there are lingering, horrendous financial impacts of those failures that we all read about over the years. I'm sure professors talk about them in their classes, and these are things that would need to be avoided in the future. So it's ever evolving to prevent the disasters that we have experienced. So by becoming a CPA, you join a body of professionals who are viewed with prestige and respect. And this career choice provides many avenues. I mean, career development and security, you can choose public accounting or private industry, for-profit, nonprofit, government agencies, so many options. You can also work in your own company and not only understand your specific product, you can understand about the accounting and, and you know, cost accounting and anything that might be necessary for you in running, say if it's your own business. So that's something to really think about as well. There's job satisfaction, working with people and staying up with those ever-changing professional standards, that body of knowledge that we live and work by as CPAs. It's, it's really very exciting. So there's a chance for growth at every avenue. I don't know if in all the years I ever stopped cracking the books, looking into this, looking into that. Um, very, very important and very rewarding. There also would be money and the benefits that go hand in hand with a career in public accounting. So my entire career has been, sent, has been spent working in firms who service clients, companies. Um, and so I was a generalist in accounting, auditing, and taxation. But I assure you that at any point, I could have taken any of those and I could have specialized. And, uh, but I chose to stay general and I just loved every minute of, of it, continue to love it. And, I'm, and I, I made the right choice for me, but there are many avenues. So I wanna say that my licensing and my experience have made me a very marketable professional, which I think was alluded to already. So that's something to remember. There, there are so many things you can do, you become very valuable and you still have choices. And that's very, very important. Now, before I close, I want to mention that over time in doing this, I've had a number of students ask, when I get there, when I graduate, I take my exam and I become licensed, will there be a place for me in the profession? And, uh, you know, the concern is all the technology, everything automated, you know, uh, replacing individuals. The studies are showing that it's really a positive net change. For the jobs that are being replaced, there are even more to replace them, just in a different way. It's going to just be a different approach to accounting and auditing. So I wouldn't be concerned. I would embrace it. 
and I would go forward and I would just, it, it will be out there and you'll just be a very, very valuable professional if you, you know, stick with that process. So I want to thank you for having us here this evening. I want to tell you that the California Board of Accountancy and our wonderful, very experienced, very qualified staff and our user-friendly website are there for you. We want to help you through the process and be sure you take advantage of that by attending programs such as this and doing other outreaches or contacting us directly. So thank you again. Thank you, President Corrigan, and uh, thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and uh, give us those insights. Uh, very good overview of what uh, the board does, but also just the opportunities. Um, before we move to the next section, there was a question. Um, most of the roles seem to be their auditor tax. Um, how would I put forward an interest in being a generalist? And I'm just going to throw that out there as a question to uh, the folks on the panel as we go through the requirements here in a minute. But I would uh, say that um, getting in as a CPA is not the end, it is the beginning. And as you move through um, your career, you're going to see that a, uh, the CPA is sort of a 360 degree degree that it can allow you to go in a multiple uh, directions, even though the entry level may seem a little narrow where that can take you. I worked for the federal government for 26 years as a CPA and did a lot of things that went beyond just grinding out you know, opinions on financial statements or tax returns. So um, with that question, uh, again, thank you, President Corrigan. We're gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, the folks on your staff. I'm going to put the slideshow up and I'm gonna let um, everyone introduce themselves and give a little bit about their background, et cetera. Hey, thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Suzanne Gracia and I'm the manager of the, of the examination unit at the CBA. I'm happy to be here to discuss uh, the CPA exam requirements and the application process with you, as well as Ramona Bermudez will be talking in a few moments as well about the CPA licensing application process. So first, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about the CPA exam, which is your first step towards CPA licensure. Uh, Thank you, John, you're on the right slide. I have a yeah, I, there may be a little delay, so forgive okay. me. When you're ready for me to go, just say next. Got it, thank you. Okay, so the CPA exam, it's a national computer-based exam that will test your skills and competencies necessary for the entry into the practice of public accountancy. There are four sections and each section is four hours long. So you have auditing and attestation, business environment and concepts, financial accounting and reporting, and regulation. So as uh, President Corrigan mentioned a little bit ago, there is going to be changes to the 2024 CPA exam. Um, and I will be discussing a little bit of that later. So how do you qualify to sit for the CPA exam? Many of you are working towards your bachelor's degree uh, and if so, you are already taking a major step in the right direction. Before you can take the CPA exam, you must meet or you must earn a bachelor's degree or higher, complete 24 semester units in accounting courses, and 24 semester units in business related courses. We refer to these as the 24 and 24. And if you've met these three requirements, then you are ready to apply. As soon as you graduate and complete the required classes, you should request for your official transcripts to be sent to us and you can submit them one of three ways. You can request your transcripts to be sent directly from your school to the CBA. Sorry, John, uh, stay back Sorry. on that last slide. That's okay. <laughs> just, just remember to say next. I'm just okay. a, little, like, a little trigger happy here. So just tell okay. me ready to say next. I won't Got click it. again until you tell me to. Okay. <laughs> Um, so again, you can request for your transcripts to be sent directly to the CBA from uh, your school. You can obtain official sealed transcripts and submit them with your CPA application, or you can order an electronic transcript to be sent to the CBA electronically. 
Uh, Golden Gate University does use the National Student Clearinghouse to allow students to order transcripts online. So you can either go through um, the portal from your school's website, or you can go directly to the uh, portal on National Student Clearinghouse House's website. Uh, please make sure that your degree has been conferred on the transcript. This is the most common issue that we find when we're reviewing applications. And then if you've completed education outside of the United States, it must be evaluated by a ZBA approved credential evaluation service. You can find the list of evaluation service providers on our website. So after requesting your transcripts or foreign education evaluations, you should next create an online client account. Next slide, please. This client account will allow you to create application remittance forms, check the status of your exam application and view your scores. I do wanna point out that even though you can create an online account, the application remittance form will still need to be printed, signed and mailed to us with the application processing fee as these forms are not submitted electronically. And once you have completed these two steps, your job for the CPA exam is done, applying for the CPA exam is done, and it is then up to us to help you get approved. When we receive the required documents, we review your file to determine if you meet the requirements, again, that you've earned a bachelor's degree and completed the 24 and 24. And if you do, you will receive an email notification with instructions on the next step and if you don't meet the requirements just yet, we will let you know what is missing. Next, please. So once you are approved, you may begin selecting your exam sections. The CPA exam is offered continuously throughout the year. The order you take each section is completely up to you, but please take into consideration your work schedule, study time, and personal commitments. Once you have selected your sections, we will send an authorization to test, also called an ATT, to the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, known as NASBA, and they will issue you a payment coupon. You will then have 90 days to submit your payment to NASBA. And it's important to know that once you have paid for the sections, we cannot remove or add sections. So if you need to make any changes, you must request them before you submit payment and prior to the expiration date of your payment coupon. Once NASBA receives your payment, they will issue you a notice to schedule, which is commonly referred to as an NTS, that will be valid for nine months. You must schedule and sit for your selected sections within this nine month period. And please make sure your NTS matches the spelling of your name on the valid identification cards that you plan to bring with you to the testing center. We don't want you to be denied entrance. So if your information is not shown correctly, let us know right away uh, so we can get that fixed. Next slide, please. To assist you in preparing for the CPA exam, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, or AICPA, provides the CPA exam blueprints to learn about the specific topics tested in each section. You can also find sample tests and tutorial topics that will help you prepare for the CPA exam. Next slide, please. And when you are ready to schedule your exams, you can do that by using ProMetrics online scheduling tool or you can contact them by telephone. The CBA allows you to test at any of Prometric's testing centers in the United States, District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Prometric testing centers are normally open six days a week. And additionally, the CBA participates in the NASBA AICPA eye exam process, which allows candidates to test and specified international metric testing centers. Information regarding eye exam is available on NASBA's website at www 
www.nasba.org. And just a, a couple of tips for the day of your scheduled exams. Uh, I suggest you arrive about 30 to 45 minutes prior to your appointment to allow time to locate the testing center, find parking and complete the check-in process. And do not forget to bring your paper NTS and identification. Without these, you will not be allowed to test and will lose all exam related fees. Next slide, please. So NASBA releases scores to the CBA and then we import them into your online client account. You can view the target score release timeline from the AICPA website. For security reasons, scores cannot be released by email or telephone. You must pass each section with a score of 75 or higher within an 18 month period. And the date you pass your first section will start the clock on this 18 month period. If one of your exam credits expires prior to passing all four parts, you will need to retake that section. And when you have passed the CPA exam, we'll send you a congratulatory letter with information on the next steps to obtain a California CPA license. When you are ready to apply for your California CPA license, there are some additional requirements to meet. And before I turn it over to Ramona, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the 2024 uh, CPA exam changes. Next slide, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, the CPA exam will be undergoing uh, changes that are expected to launch January 2024. Although the 2024 CPA exam is not yet finalized, it is important to know as you are the future of the accounting profession and may be entering the pipeline as a CPA candidate when the changes occur. The CPA Evolution Initiative is a joint effort of NASBA and the AICPA aimed to transform the CPA licensure model in recognition of the rapidly changing skills and competencies the practice requires today and will require in the future. Along with NASBA and the AICPA, state CPA societies, state boards of accountancy, academia, firms of all sizes, and CPAs in all areas of practice from across the country are vital partners in preparing the profession for the future. Their collaboration and support in implementing the new CPA licensure model will help the profession remain strong and relevant while protecting the public interest in a constantly changing business environment. And next slide, please. So NASBA and the AICPA are moving forward with a core plus discipline licensure model. The CPA exam will continue to test candidates' competencies in accounting, auditing, tax, and technology. However, in addition to those core, or core areas, candidates will be expected to demonstrate more in-depth knowledge in one of three, uh, in one of the three proposed areas business reporting and analysis, information systems and controls, and tax compliance and planning. This model will enhance public protection by producing candidates who have the deep knowledge necessary to perform high quality work, be responsive to feedback by requiring all candidates to demonstrate strong core competencies, require deeper proven knowledge in one of the three disciplines that are pillars of the profession, be adaptive and flexible, helping to future-proof the CPA as the profession evolves and results in one CPA license. A candidate's chosen discipline does not mean the CPA is limited to practice in that area. NASBA and the AICPA anticipate that not all of the content covered by the current CPA exam and curriculum will be considered core under the new licensure model. Instead, certain advanced content, content in the current core could be incorporated into those disciplines. 
The specific content of the core and disciplines will be determined by state board education requirements and a CPA exam practice analysis, which is periodically conducted by the AICPA to maintain the validity and reliability. For more information about CPA evolution and the proposed changes to the exam, you can visit the CPA evolution website at evolution of cpa.org. This page is updated when new information is provided, so you can monitor this page for updates. I am now happy to turn it over to Ramona Bermudez uh, to provide an overview of the licensing requirements and application process. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone for coming today, I really appreciate it. And I am Ramona Bermudez. I am the manager of the licensing, initial licensing unit. And I am happy to be here to discuss the licensing requirements and application process to obtain your CPA license. As you prepare to apply for licensure, it is important that you ensure that all necessary requirements are met in order to have a smooth and experience, smooth of an experience as possible. When you qualify to sit for the CPA exam, you likely already met most, if not all, the, of the education requirements to obtain your licensure. The additional education we'll be looking for is 20 semester units of accountancy study and 10 semester units of ethics study, three semester units of which must be in a course in accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities, and a minimum of 150 total semester units. Next slide, please. You will also need to complete a minimum of one year of general accounting experience under the supervision of an actively licensed CPA. When accepting job offers, it is best to inform your employer of your intent to pursue a CPA license to ensure they are eligible to sign off on your experience. It's a good idea to have your experience form signed and submitted to the CBA as you earn it, regardless of whether, regardless of whether you're ready to apply or not. Applicants and supervisors may change jobs or relocate, and it is sometimes difficult to locate your signer at a later date. Completion of the general accounting experience requirement will allow you to perform all of the services of a CPA with the exception of signing reports on attested engagements, which includes planning audits, preparing work papers, and preparing full disclosure financial statements. If you want to sign reports on attest engagements, you will also need to complete a minimum of 500 hours in attest functions under the supervision of a licensed CPA who is authorized to sign reports on attest engagements. Next slide, please. There are a couple of other items that you must satisfy in order to obtain licensure. Completion of the California Specific Professional Ethics Examinations or PET administered online by the California Society of CPAs or CalCPA. Upon successful completion of PET, CalCPA will send your score to the CBA electronically. Your test results for the PET exam are valid for two years. If your application is not submitted within 24 months, you will have to take it again. You, you also will need to submit fingerprints as part of criminal background history check. Authorization and information on how to complete this will be provided after we are in receipt of your CPA application. Next slide, please. When submitting your application, please be sure to include an email address so that we can notify you sooner if there's anything needed to complete your file. Once the CBA has received your application and fee, you will receive an acknowledgement email, including the authorization and instructions on obtaining fingerprints. Live scan forms and fingerprint cards will be provided to you by the CBA. CBA staff will review the application and notify you of the outcome. If an application is approved for licensure, the CBA will provide you with an approval notification and instructions on how to submit your initial licensing fee. If an application is not approved for licensure, you'll be sent a letter 
advising what is outstanding. Next slide, please. You should have been provided links to additional tools that will help you during the application process for either the CPA exam or the CPA license. These tools are available on our CPA website. We have a self-assessment worksheet that will help you track your classes and plan for any future education you may need. There is also an education tip sheet that breaks down the requirements and will help you determine where a particular course may qualify. Next slide, please. There is a wealth of information available on our website that explains the requirements to qualify and that will assist you in preparing for and taking the CPA exam, as well as navigating the initial licensure process. In our applicants section, you will find the online applications and links to various forms and the Unifor CPA Examination Handbook and Licensing Applicant Handbook. Additionally, the CBA maintains a series of frequently asked questions that will assist you in understanding the requirements to qualify for licensure. Next slide, please. If at any time during your application process, the CBA can be of any assistance, we have dedicated staff to assist you every step of the way. We understand the time and the commitment you make when you are pursuing your CPA license, and we want to make the process as seamless as possible for you. We encourage you to connect us with us on social media via Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and sign up for email updates. This will help you stay informed on the developments of the CBA. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Ms. Gracia and I, We'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. In addition to, I have a team member who I invited, Jennifer Huddy, who is here to also assist with questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you, um, Suzanne. That was a very informative um, set of information. Um, I know I've got some questions. We're gonna open it up uh, to the folks here in a couple seconds, so get ready to unmute and ask your questions, but we did have one um, that was chatted in, so I'll go ahead and um, start with that one, okay? Uh, and the question was for the core areas, uh, outside of the core areas, does a uh, candidate select their area, tax, business, or does the exam randomly point them in one of those areas when they take their exam? Um, I did glance at the question I yeah. did glance at the question in the chat. I just want to make sure um, they were asking in regards to the disciplines for the new exam. That was my sense. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what it, okay. Um, so yes, you would actually get to choose your own discipline. Um, and from what I'm understanding from the information we have now um, is that you can choose a discipline. If you fail it, you can choose a different discipline. So you don't have to choose the same discipline each time, but you're not able to choose all three or four at once. So. Okay. And is there a, like a, a, like a, a, a mathematical like level that's being pushed like calculus level one or calculus level two, where it would, there's a dividend be paid to like advance those skills in preparation for the test or is that is it more uh, algebraic, arithmetic, this kind of thing? Yeah, that, oh, I, I was just gonna say that, that uh, I, that's information I don't have as of now. Um, you know, as the AICPA, AICPA is still going through the exam uh, practice analysis, um, some of the details will be finalized once that's completed and there will be more information on that later. Uh, with the experts in the room, I guess when I looked at the way the 2024 exam is being proposed, it looked to me like the major impact maybe was gonna be on the BEC section of the exam or are we too far ahead to even have that sort of a notion? I think I think it would be accurate in saying that, John. 
Yeah. Okay, good. Um, why don't we go ahead then and uh, see if anyone else has questions. Oh, there might have been something else ch chatted in. Uh, yeah, this is a good question. If you were to take two parts of the CPA exam at once, uh, would they happen on the same date or two different dates? Uh, my advice as your instructor would be don't do that because you can <laughs> take it on two different days. And in the olden days, you had to take all four parts of the exam over a two and a half day period. Now you can schedule the exams and you can space them out accordingly but if a person wanted to my i guess if you could do that you could take like one exam in the morning and then go and sleep in your car and come back and take the two part i think i wouldn't advise that though let me turn it over to the group to the to the experts though yeah again it's really up to you know the it's really up to the individuals how they want to schedule their exam sections um, like John said, it's, it's highly unusual for anyone to want to take two exam sections in one day. Um, of course, if the, you know, more power to you, if you, if you want to at attempt it. Um, but I think just the, the, the level of you focus, the level of focus you need for just one exam section. Um, I personally, in my, I would find it challenging for someone like myself to um, take two sections in one day. Yeah, and you all know where to find me. Uh, I can plan your life for you for the next six months, <laughs> if you like, including exam dates. Um, the other question that came in is re a really good one. Uh, so I wanna call that out and don't wanna hog the mic, but um, do study.com credits transfer or is that something you'd be able to answer? Um, I'm not too familiar what study.com what study.com is, but basically for any education to be considered and to be counted towards the education requirements um, is it it does have to be taken at an accredited um, regionally or nationally accredited school. So it has to be awarded on an educational transcript, provide the, the course title and the number of units that is being rewarded. Uh, what's the best way to determine if a college is accredited? You have sort of a good start. Um, well, the, the best way is if you're not sure is to contact the school itself. Um, if you have copies of your transcripts, accreditation is always almost listed on the back of it. I, I know for sure Golden Gate uh, University is accredited by Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And then if you do need to find out um, what the accrediting bodies are, we do have a list of those in our handbook, our uh, CPA exam handbook that's on our website. Excellent. Uh, let me not hog the mic, guys, please. Um, unmute and jump on in. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I got my bachelor degree from university in Iran. I'm studying right now for my master's in uh, accounting, Golden Gate University. I want to know, is my bachelor's degree is acceptable or not because it's from Iran? Thank you. Um, for education that's completed outside of the United States, it's best to have your uh, foreign educational documents evaluated by one of our CBA approved credential evaluation services. Um, that's the best way for us to determine uh, if you have a, a bachelor's degree equivalent to a, a, a US bachelor's degree. Um, you know, now, depending on the master's program that you're in right now with Golden Gate University, if your Golden Gate University transcript lists uh, that your bachelor's degree was earned and that they've accepted it to enter you into this master's program, um, it's likely that we can accept it off of your Golden Gate University transcript. Uh, however, you know, we would need to make that determination once we actually see your official uh, transcript in person. Okay, thank you. I'm studying the account, Master of Accounting and they accepted my bachelor degree. So I think 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Um, one question that we have on the chat, and it, um, I, I'm going to, the person that chatted in, forgive me if I'm going to edit it a little bit, because uh, I'm going to combine it with, um, if a person submits their application before they meet all of the requirements, what happens? Because the question that's being asked is, if the transcripts have been submitted once and there's no change in education after, does one have to resubmit the transcripts? So I'm reading into that question that I submitted my transcripts. I didn't meet the requirements. What happens? Do I have to resubmit the transcripts at that point or what would be the next steps? No, so ba basically what would happen is we'll let you know what, what um, items that are deficient. And so it, it would be up to the individual to obtain additional classes um, to meet the requirements or you know, finish the degree program to earn their degree. Uh, and then the, you'll have one year to correct these deficiencies. You do not have to submit your transcripts again unless you are getting additional transcript from that same school. Um, then of course we would need your new transcript so that we can um, total up your new uh, uh, units. And then also, you know, if you were going to um, obtain education in a different school, uh, then we would just ask that you send us the transcript for the additional education that you've obtained. But we will keep all of your transcripts on file. Suzanne, do they have to repay their application fee during that one year? Oh. Period? Um, no, during the one year, uh, you don't have to resubmit an application. If that one year does pass without fixing um, any of the deficiencies, uh, then they would have to reapply again. Um, we had one more a question about the new exam. And uh, Ramona, don't think we we're going to have you off the book here <laughs> yet. So. <laughs> I'm going to hopefully get a couple of experience questions here in a minute, but um, the question was, when was the last day to take um, the exam before the new exam? And the person said in 2022, I think they mean in 2024. So I, would it be December 31st, 2023? Or is there, a, do, you, do we know if there's a date beyond January 1st, 2024? Um, so right now it's anticipated to launch in January 2024. Um, so at, the, at this time, I would say the last, you know, the last um, available opportunity for the current exam would be in 2023. Um, of course, as it gets closer, I'm sure there will be uh, more information on a transitional, um, a transitional plan from students who are currently taking the current CP exam and then maybe having to complete it um, with a new format. So, so you might pass two of the old and then have to come back in and pass two under the new format. Correct, correct. But I, you know, right now it's still um, not yet finalized with that information. So I do recommend you know, following the evolution of CPA page um, for updates on, on the new exam. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start off the questions here with experience. Um, and so the uh, one question that uh, I've heard a lot is how long after I complete my exam do I have to actually get my one year of experience? Um, John, I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to my team member, Jennifer Huddy, to help answer this question for you. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ramona. After you pass all four parts of the CPA exam, your scores do not expire. So you, uh, you can apply for exam at any time after you've passed all four parts, but you need to keep in mind that when you do submit your license application, you need to meet the requirements that are in place at that time. So I think part of the question has to do with when you should complete your experience. And we'll accept experience that's completed at any time, as long as it's completed under the supervision of someone who holds an active license to practice public accountancy. 
So if I received my experience, say, 10 years ago, and then I passed the exam, I could claim that experience from 10 years ago? Yeah, the experience was qualifying. And uh, by that, we mean, again, being under the supervision of somebody holding an active uh, license to practice public accountancy, then we should be able to accept it um, any numbers later. It becomes more difficult to verify experience, the, depending on the length of time that passes. So um, one of the things that was mentioned in the presentation was that when you complete your experience, regardless of whether you intend to apply for your license at that time, you should have your supervisor complete a form and submit a copy of that to the CBA. We will hold it on file infinitely, but you should also retain a copy for your records in case it needs to be referenced in the future. Um, if someone is uh, certified in another country, um, can they get a California CPA through that certification? Would they have to retake the exam? That might be an examining question. Too. We have uh, mutual recognition agreements with certain uh, foreign accountancy bodies, and that information is available on the NASBO website. Um, I, I think we're talking about the International Qualifications Exam, IQEX. So if you go to NASBO's website and search for that, you'll find a little bit more information. But if you pass the IQEX exam, you can apply in California as a type E applicant without having to take the California C or with, without having to take the uniform CPA exam. Excellent. I just wanted to verify um, a statement, a part of the presentation. I have two years, I can pass the ethics exam two years before I apply for my license, the, the 50 question ethics exam? Mm -hmm. The ethics exam needs to be passed with a score of 90 or above within two years of submitting your license application. So if you take the ethics exam before you submit your license application, you need to make sure that application comes to us within two years. Otherwise you take the exam again before you qualify for licensure. Great, thank you. Um, some questions are coming in. Um, um, how does the CPA receive my work experience from the CPA I worked for? Just we're talking about the Form E or Form G process. Mm -hmm. So we can accept uh, certificates of experience by mail or by email now. Um, if we don't have a license application on file, though, unfortunately, we aren't able to verify the receipt of the experience document. So the best way to know that it's been received if you don't have a license application on file is to send it, if you're mailing a hard copy, send it with some sort of tracking information that includes delivery confirmation. Or if you email it to us, staff will respond and confirm that the document's been received. Okay, um, I'm falling behind on the questions a little bit, so mm -hmm. let me um, try to do the best I can here. Um, uh, sorry, guys, I see I went too far. Give me one second. Um, I heard far is the hardest part. Some people recommend taking that part first. I'm not sure that the CBA wants to necessarily get in on that. I can tell you that uh, from my experience in teaching folks that pass the CPA exam, um, sometimes it is a matter of talking to you or your tax person or your accounting person. I would say that if you're going to be joining an organized course, uh, come on in, the water's fine. I mean, we get you through uh, whatever exam it is that you happen to be preparing for. But if there are comments that uh, the board has, board uh, folks have. Um, you know, we definitely can't really comment on the complexity of each of the sections. Um, for one, you know, we're, we're not CPA, so we haven't even, you know, we don't take the exam and, um, you know, we can't speak on experience on that. Um, but I, you know, I do want to remind, remind you that the AICPA does provide sample tutorial test for each section. So, you know, definitely check the site out, um, check out some sample exams as uh, so you can kind of 
see what content what content is provided or is given for each exam, um, and that should be able to give you an idea, uh, you know what what how to plan out your sections. Thank you. I see an important question coming in uh, that I definitely want to address um, because the comment is that it sounds like if GGU accepts transfer units than the board does, and I know that's not right, so I want to, I want to go ahead and blow that up right now. And, yeah, and so, other words, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, you know, if if transfer credits are listed on GGU's transcript, and as long as it shows the course title, course name that was accepted by GGU, and as long as the number of units that were awarded for the class is listed on the transcript we can um, accept them off of the GGU transcript. Um, okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I want to make sure that I'm clear. I thought the candidate had to submit a transcript from each school they attended. It's recommended. Um, uh -huh. It's definitely recommended because we don't, you know, most of the time you don't know what's going to show up on uh, w whichever school that you obtain your degree from. Um, you know, a lot of students are surprised that their transcripts don't show or that they're just itemized into a lump sum, you know, so we can't offer or, you know, we can't accept um, credits if we don't know what it was for. Um, so it, it's recommended to, um, but as long as if, if you know that your school is listing the transfer credits um, with an itemized list and units listed, we can accept them that way. Oh, okay, that's excellent because I I was always under the impression that, that was the case for advanced placement units. Um, that if it listed out, say, as accounting, it'd be counted as accounting. But now I'm understanding that if the school lists out the course, say community college, say study.com listed out the course as accounting, it could count towards accounting. And does that mean if it was on GGU's transcript? Does that also mean that if they gave me a lump sum and didn't call out the class, that I could use those units towards the 150? I know I couldn't use it towards the specified 78, but the 72 that are not specified, could I use it towards that? Um, Jennifer Huddy, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe if, if the lump sum is listed on the transcript, that that number can be awarded towards the 150. Suzanne, that's right. We can accept bulk transfer units that aren't itemized to qualify for the 150 requirement as long as we, as long as the transfer units don't clearly overlap with another transcript that we've received. So that's a consideration too. If you have multiple transcripts and one of them shows a lump sum of transfer units, we need to be able to determine how many of those don't overlap and then we would apply those to the 150. So I have, let's say, 72 units that are called out classes. Let's say I took at GGU. I went to XYZ Community College and it says 78 units, but it doesn't call them out. I'm good, right? Because I've got my, when I say 72 units, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking experience and license, 24 accounting, 24 business, 20 more accounting and 10 ethics is where I'm getting the uh, 78 units that are specified to 72 can be in anything, right? To bring me up to the 150. That's right. That's how we would calculate those transfer units for licensing. We'll okay. bring them over to get you to 150. Okay. And those could, okay, good. Um, sorry, guys. I guess I'm getting more out of this than anybody. So I appreciate you being here, but let me uh, see if there are a couple more questions and then we're gonna move into our next part of the program. I'll tell you what, um, David Hem uh, Hemphill is on here and he really did a lot to organize this. David, did I miss something critical that you might wanna call out in the chat? No, John, I think you got all the uh, big questions. How about one question that you didn't address, and this is a good one. Can work experience be through online work for a company or does it have to be on location? I think that's good, especially in today's current climate. 
So maybe Jennifer, you can address that one. Jennifer, please. Sure Thank you. Thing. So the requirement for experience that qualifies is that you work under the supervision of an individual licensed to practice public accountancy. And the definition of supervision is, uh, the definition of a supervisor is someone who has authority and oversight over you as the employee and who's familiar with your work. So that doesn't necessarily uh, preclude working online. And I know most of us are working online and um, not currently on location. So I don't think that would necessarily be a conflict. Um, the only situation that's specifically prohibited is that you're, the person who signs your experience form cannot be a CPA providing public accounting services to your employer. That's the only specific situation that's called out as unacceptable. But other than that, if you have a CPA supervising you who has authority and oversight and familiarity with your work, it shouldn't be a problem. And their license has to be active, most importantly. Okay, great. I'm seeing a couple more questions uh, that I think might be worth clarifying. Um, CPA exam lasts forever. Once you pass the exam, my understanding is you can start your acting career, become a motion, you know, an action hero, and then come back and complete your experience after you're done in Hollywood, right? Yeah, so that's good forever. Um, that question came in. I'm going to ask the question, can anyone take the CPA exam again after they've passed all four parts? Could a crazy person say, gee, I missed the exam so much, I'd like to take it again. Would that be allowed? Um, actually, once you pass the exam, I don't believe, I, uh, you know, this has never happened in, in my experience with the CBA, but I don't believe you would be approved to take the CPA exam again. Um, so, you know, once you pass off for parts, the scores don't expire, um, you know, and I would just, you know, it's, it's such an accomplishment to be able to pass the CPA exam. So if you do, you know, congratulations to you and embrace, um, you know, that you've worked so hard to, to pass it. And, you know, we're happy to help you out and, and, and work with you to get your license. Don't mess with it. <laughs> Don't mess with a good thing. Um, I'm, we're gonna do one more question from the chat. Um, the question was about continuing professional education requirements, which you have to have 80 uh, continuing professional education hours every two years with certain spe specific requirements after you uh, get your license, but can those CPE type credits generally be used to sit for the exam? And I guess um, if they came from an accredited college, yes, if not, no. That's correct. So if, so we generally don't, you know, accept continuing education or continuing professional education classes um, to meet the requirements for the CPA exam. Um, now, however, if you if you took that as a course, you know, from a school and they awarded you either semester or quarter units, um, and it is from a regionally or nationally accredited institution, uh, then we would accept um, that as education. Since but it's, uh, I'm going to ask, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just going to say it's not, um, it, it, it's not common that a CPE or a CE course is um, awarded semester or quarter units. Right. We've got a couple more questions coming in the chat, guys, and we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to suck your brain. Okay. <laughs> Get some of these answered. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, Professor Lords. Yeah. Uh-huh. Since I, I believe that question came from me, uh, this is Matthew Alderet. Um, I, I believe that may be for me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I have had this situation, like for instance, I'm trying to learn um, bookkeeping and QuickBooks Online does a course. And I believe during that course, they offer CPE that's qualified for the CP, uh, for the, the CPAs for, for CPE stuff. That's what I was referring to is stuff like that. Does that count? It's not necessarily an accredited university, but it's, somehow they provide CPE credits. 
No, that type of that type of course would not count to meet the education requirements for the CPA exam or the CPA license. Okay. Um, but something like that would something like that would um, I'm pretty sure would be counted once you are licensed and you have to you know get your 80 hours of CE. Something like that could be counted towards your 80 hours of CE. I guess that's what I was saying. If I took that, you know, in close enough proximity time wise to actually getting licensed would that count towards my CPE requirement that I need to have in the future after I'm already licensed and already taken the tests via the other, um, you know, requirements or whatever. Okay. So yeah, in that case, it wouldn't count until once you've obtained your license, then any CE taken after that is what would count okay. towards your 80 hours. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. That, that, thank you for that clarification. Um, do the ethics courses need to have the term ethics or religion in the title? And of course, we kind of have two classes of ethics. We have the three units of accounting industry ethics that everyone has to take um, in order to get licensed. Um, and here at GDU, that's accounting 302. But then I guess this question is probably aiming more towards the seven units of additional ethics that would bring the person up to the 10 years? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And then Jennifer, if you have anything to add, feel free to chime in. Um, so for the ethics courses, uh, if, you, if you check out the link that we sent um, that has the educational tip sheet, I believe it's in green, correct? <laughs> the right. ethics section is in green. Um, so there's a list of um, types of courses that you can take uh, that will meet that, se that seven semester units of ethics. And then of course, to meet that 10, you just have to make sure that three of those 10 are in a course uh, titled accounting ethics or accountants professionals responsibilities. Um, and I'm, I, may miss, I may have misspoke. I don't think the title has to be that. I think the content of the course has to relate to accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities. But as far as the other seven units go, um, it could be the title, it could be the content related to those subjects listed in that area. Okay, great. Um... Well, we have one last question. We go ahead and put that one up and then we're going to move to the next portion of our program because we are uh, running a little bit behind here. Um, the last question was, um, can the CPA be someone that provided services to a previous employer? Um, I guess that's talking about, can I claim experience from a previous employer, I guess. So that is uh, the situation that is called out in section 12 and 12.5 of the CBA regulation. Um, if, you're, if the person signing as your supervisor is a CPA providing public accounting services to your employer, that won't qualify for uh, the experience requirement to obtain a license. Okay, great. Okay, I want to move to the next section, guys. Hey, this is great. I mean, you could probably tell the level of interest uh, that we have in the information. And so uh, I'm going to uh, unfortunately have to move to the next section because we've got some great speakers that are going to talk to us a little bit about uh, their experience coming from Golden Gate, getting the license, and how uh, they have progressed their careers. So do we have the Moss Adams folks on? Raj. Hey, John. How you doing? This is Raj here. Hey, Raj. Uh, go ahead. Why don't you take away and introduce David as well when you're ready, and then we'll um, move to, uh, we've got Mary that we want to hear from as well, so go for it. Sounds good. Hey, everyone. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Raj Gupta. I'm a partner with Moss Adams in uh, the San Francisco Walnut Creek office. Um, I specialize in real estate. I do some private equity, and I've uh, been with the firm for about eight years now, uh, spent some time at, at the big four when I first started my career, been at Moss uh, ever since. Uh, and I um, completed my master's degree with Golden Gate in tax and uh, served on the alumni board of directors for, I don't know, four years. And I think I'm on the alumni tax board as well, I think. 
they haven't kicked me off yet. Yeah. Dave, you wanna you wanna give a quick intro? Oh, Raj, uh, so are you glad you became a CPA, or are you still pursuing that singing career? You know, John, I want Dave to go first. I mean, he's got he's got all the fun stories about what a CPA does, but I, oh, I'll okay. tell you all about why I'm glad to be a CPA in a minute. Okay, sure. You know, January 25th, it's still okay to be a CPA. So I'm a, I'm a <laughs> but uh, I'm Dave Heyer. I'm a senior manager in the San Francisco office. I started with Moss about three years ago, uh, started public accounting in 2003. Um, and I think I've found my home at this point, but I specialize in construction. I know enough tax to get myself in trouble, uh, but I'm on the assurance side uh, currently. So nice to meet you all. Okay. Any, anything, anything else? It's a good story, war stories or something? What's your most, what was the hardest tax return you had to fill out? Oof. <laughs> so, so John, I'll tell you this, Dave, he says he's dangerous enough to do tax and we've worked on some accounts together and I can tell you, uh, he's pretty much a tax guy. So, you know, you, when, when you hire Dave to do an audit, you're getting both an audit and tax guy. So it's, it's, it's double duty with him. Um, so don't let him fool you about this audit nonsense that he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I can tell you guys as a CPA, um, it's a you know game changer. You can tell I'm not a marketing guy coming up with that uh, slogan, but um, it is, uh, I don't know anyone who became a CPA and later said, what a mistake. Geez, why did I do that? Uh, whether it ends up being working for a big firm like Moss um, or working for the government like I did or not even working. Uh, as an accountant, um, you know, that the rigors of that experience uh, are going to take you a long way. As evidenced by Mary, and I'm going to go ahead and let Mary talk because she's got uh, some really uh, good things that have happened to her along the way after coming from Golden Gate. Hi, thank you. My name is Mary Jiang, and I got my accounting degree uh, at Golden Gate University and then went to work in industry for a period of time. And then later, and then I also like John went to work for the, uh, the government. I worked for the franchise tax board for 20 years uh, in the audit department. So there we were auditing high net worth and corporation, the tax shelters, all those exciting things that was happening, you know, in the uh, early 2000s. And then um, I got licensed through uh, the Franchise Tax Board. We had a program that enabled uh, auditors to become licensed CPA. And I want to share an interesting story because someone asked a question about do we, you know, do you do your work experience online or in person? Um, well, one of the things if you do attestation, uh, you have to what what they call remember those days you had account inventory. And so, you know, so well, FTB didn't have any inventory. So they uh, partnered us with uh, Department of uh, Correction, uh, the prisons. Guess what? They have a, a, a store there. And so I went down there to do inventory at, at a women's prison. It was a really ex surreal experience. And they told me to uh, say, okay, when you come to work, don't wear a uh, uh, blue jeans and uh, 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 denim pants. And I say, why not? Well, that's their uniform. <laughs> and so you may sh I, wish I made sure I wore brown khaki pants and brown khaki shirt that day to stand out. But, you know, they, uh, FTP helped me get licensed. And that helped me when I was doing auditing with uh, the CPAs uh, that represented the corporations and the, and the employees. So after retiring, from the Franchise Tax Board, I decided to go over to the other side of the fence uh, to help the, the people to not get audited now because uh, I understand what the FTB and IRS are looking for. So that was a lot of really fulfilling and rewarding to help people who sometimes get themselves into trouble. And so that's the rewarding part of the job. And, um, and then one of the things that once you become a CPA, like I say, it's very respected, people trust you. And you, as a trusted advisor, that is something that, you know, you, you have, you know, you, you get it. I mean, 
nobody tells dirty jokes about the CPA like they do with the lawyers, excuse me. But the idea is because you're a trust advisor and someone asked the question, you know, do we go audit only or tax only? Well, in the CPA profession, it's really a lot of road that you could fulfill. You could be in audit, you could be in tax, you could be in consulting, you could be in financial planning. That's the newest, right now in this year's economy, last year's economy, the C trusted CPA had become financial advisor helping everybody with PPP loans. And that's what I did. You know, all some people said, how to navigate this? So they open so much avenue for you that is really, really rewarding. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I say I, I recommend anybody to go in the profession to help because that's what you wanted to do. And I also uh, work with VITA and tax aid to do pro bono tax return because there's a lot of people who need assistance and can't afford it. And that's a way of giving back to the community. So I think in many of our profession, um, giving back to the community is something that I find rewarding and important. And I, I encourage everybody to do that. And obviously they, they always tell you, good to have a mentor and good to do networking so that you get to meet other people. And I think John and I had a, a history where when we had, we were at San Francisco State University at an accounting uh, uh, night. And I met John then and when I told, I, I was there doing a five minute spiel about what it's like to be a CPA. And I mentioned that I was uh, on the CPA board. And John, before I could leave the meeting, came and said, Mary, I need to talk to you. And I said, what? And he said, well, remember Suzanne was mentioning that before you could sit for the CPA exam, you have to get your degree conferral and before you could sit for the exam. Well, John had this bright idea that I heard that some other states allow people to get sit for the exam before they get the bachelor degree conferral. Uh, is that something that California could do? And I said, I don't know, John, but I'm willing to uh, bring it to someone's attention if you will write me up a paragraph describing exactly what you wanted. And I, he did. And I brought it to Patty Bauer and mentioned that, you know, Professor John Lord had this idea to see if we could help the students to get their, you know, sit for the exam much sooner so to get them into the working world. And Patty thought that was an interesting idea and have staff do some research and found out that, yeah, 10 other states does staff. And so we had uh, a assemblywoman present a bill in 2020 to uh, pass a, a, a rule that would allow students to take it. Unfortunately, COVID hit, COVID-19 hit, and so they shelved that because they were busy fighting the you know, coronavirus uh, and all the legislation. But I'm happy, and I told John, and I'm sorry, John, they put it, uh, a, a table it for now, but we'll, we'll try to see when we get it uh, revived. So I'm happy to report that uh, Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin is willing to carry this a bill in 2021 to see if we can get it passed so that John could be happy and tell all his students and now you can sit for exam you know, before you graduate. But you still have to meet all the requirements before Suzanne and, and, and Ramona will let you get you the license. But at least this is the way of somehow the fates are in line that you know, we can help uh, some some of the students. So anyway, I thought that was exciting job of me be on, on the CPA and be able to carry an idea to it and we we'll hope to see it in fruition before the end of this year. So, but anyway, um, this is this is something that I find rewarding as well. So thank you for listening to me. Well, no, that Mary, that's fantastic. I mean, that I always love listening to Mary speak because it just goes full circle from getting your bachelor's degree, coming back to Golden Gate, you know, getting experience, helping individuals, coming full circle back to, you know, having an impact on making the requirements maybe um, fit better with um, your career progression and stuff. And I, I think that's really a nice uh, wrap up to what we've been talking about and gotten some of the nuts and bolts but getting through those things lead to the different opportunities that you've been 
uh, hearing about. So um, I do want to take a couple of seconds uh, to ask um, Moss to give us, was going to give us a little bit of information or talk a little bit about some of the opportunities where you could go to Moss, one of the big firms right across the street from Golden Gate, and um, you can um, get your experience and stuff. So I know that there's some opportunities there that we were going to hear about. Yeah, John, and just I'll, I'll just add really quick to what Mary was saying. One great thing, well, two great things about being in the accounting world. A, you always have a job. E even in down markets, uh, accounting people generally kind of make out pretty well. So if you're looking for job security across the board, you, you can't go wrong in accounting. And, you know, I know financial incentives aren't everything in life. I recognize that. But, you know, I just I will throw this out there. I, I come from a family of doctors. And uh, when one day we were sitting around the dinner table and my brother, who's a surgeon, spent 15 years going to like the top schools studying to be a surgeon. And we were talking about earning potential as potentially being a partner at the big four middle market firms, whatever it is, compared to what doctors are currently making. He just couldn't believe it, that some of the earning potential that's available in the industry. So, you know, a lot of people, I always say it's the best kept secret out there uh, in the accounting world that there is just, you can do really well for yourself. So for some of the folks just starting out, getting their exams done, just know it's not all about, you know, oh, I'm an auditor, I'm a tax guy. There's a lot of financial freedom kind of at the end of the tunnel. Um, Dave, do you want to talk about some of, you know, the internships and positions that might be coming up or you want me to round that out? Uh, no, you can go ahead with that. I was just going to add just the, the camaraderie you have. So not only are you helping clients, but it's the, the teams you're on. And, uh, and we do have a lot of fun. I mean, you know, uh, Mary, when you were talking about inventory counts, I remember having a new staff and I was probably five years in and we had him go uh, count equity. Um, and uh, as his inventory observation, he didn't, uh, he didn't come back for a couple hours. I don't know what he was doing, but um, <laughs> That was a lot of fun. Anyway. So, so John, I'll be quick. I know you have an agenda and we're over. Uh, so we have internship opportunities coming up. We have kind of various programs, uh, GPS interns, which is kind of like earlier in your collegiate career. Uh, I would say Merrill, who's our campus recruiter, hasn't given me all the information, but I think John is connected with Rose and Merrill. Anyone who's interested, you know, feel free to reach out to Merrill. She can tell you about kind of deadlines when they're coming up. Um, the internships. I think there's a deadline in late February to apply. We're always hiring. Um, the firm, you know, last year was a fairly decent year with everything that kind of happened. Uh, thanks for having us, John. Yeah, sure. And what we'll do, um, I'll get some information about that from uh, Rose and, and her folks, and uh, we'll distribute that to the um, folks on the mailing list. Uh, CBA folks, is it okay if we share the slides and you don't have to answer that now, but if we're okay with that, we'll send that out um, as well so that folks may be able to see the slides that they want. Of course, you have the links to the various documents. Uh, what I wanna do quickly, because uh, I know it's getting late and folks are probably getting tired and gotta cook dinner and all that sort of stuff still, but um, these courses that you see up on the screen now, our courses here at GGU uh, that are aligned with the uh, different parts of the exam. And so what we do here is we um, further your understanding of the topics here, have you do some um, papers and some research, but we've also aligned them so that they are helping you towards your goal of passing uh, the CPA exam as well. And what's good about this uh, program that I like about it is you can use these to complete your bachelor's, to start your master's. You can use these classes if you are already working at a firm. Maybe there's some folks at Moss that want to uh, take these classes to now progress on to their master's and uh, maybe help them to get a leg up on parts of the exam. So you can see the uh, dates for the upcoming courses. One of them is currently going on, which is aligning with the uh, regulation section of the exam. And I wanted to introduce Alice, uh, who is teaching that. I hope she's still on the call and she might be able to say a quick uh, couple words about the classes that she's, uh, the class that she's teaching right now. And you can see some of the dates with some of the others.
Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Jung, and I'm currently teaching Accounting 379. Um, I currently work in tax. I'm a tax senior at ACG. Uh, having passed the reg exam, uh, I'm really glad to be helping students right now. We're currently entering week three, and so hopefully um, we can help others pass and have a great experience as we all did in getting to pass all the exams. So thanks, John, for the intro. Passed all four parts, not just just not just Reg and uh, she's uh, that close to getting her CPA. She just got to get the ethics exam, right? Uh, yes. so. Okay. Um, well, look, I'm not going to um, you know keep hold us any longer. I want to express appreciation to uh, President Corrigan and um, the CBA folks. This was, uh, you know. Um, you might have probably been able to tell um, sort of my dream was to talk to you all and, and pick your brain a little bit about some of the things and I'm glad that some of the students got a chance to ask questions directly via chat and whatnot. Um, for our other speakers, guys, thank you so much. I'm always, uh, I'm always um, uh, impressed, warmed by what I hear uh, other folks sharing like my own experience. Uh, the opportunities that the uh, CPA uh, offers, and I've been able to see that accrue to, uh, you know, sounds some maybe like I'm I'm exaggerating, but it's probably getting up into you know thousands of students now over the years that uh, have uh, you know had good success after going through the process. So it's a lot of work, but it's well worth it. So uh, with that, unless I'm forgetting something. Thank you, everyone, and thanks, uh, Dave Hemphill, for uh, for helping me to coordinate this whole thing. Dave didn't say much, but he was an instrumental guy to kind of help me to uh, help us to link everything up. So thanks, Dave. Yep. John, thank you, John. John. Thank you, everyone. Can I just add one more thing, John? Um, so I I know some questions in the chat were coming at us really fast. So if there's any questions that we didn't answer for somebody, you know, please reach out to us. Um, we're definitely happy to help you and, and answer any questions that you may have. Okay, excellent. We will, we might very well take you up on that. I'm sure we will. Okay, everybody. Hey, thanks again. Have a good rest of the evening. Um, and again, thanks for, thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.